is solar punk. I mean, we have a very beautiful definition in the program um, about an aesthetic uh, movement and a cultural movement that aims to be like the you know brighter side of cyberpunk. But the thing that excites us really about solar punk is not just the plans and the Studio Ghibli vibes and this you know solar tag and the green tag, but it's more the vibe or how we imagine like really um, living there in the future like how does it really feel to be a person living in in solar bank and that that is essentially what the imaginary is because if we look at the difference between cyberpunk and solar punk is not so much the tech that's different as in like the infrastructure that we're in because pretty much they're both like highly advanced um, technological societies but it's rather like how we're using this technology and the difference in precisely how we use and the narratives, the cultural narratives and like the cultural background in which these two very different worlds take place um, is the imaginary. So basically they're similar infrastructure, but just a different imaginary that different manifestations of the imaginary that take place. And imaginaries are this word that gets, okay, that gets thrown a lot, uh, gets thrown a lot around recently it's yeah it's just become is this concept in sociology um that is kind of new to our imaginary again but uh right now it's getting it's getting a lot of traction and there is a specific reason of why we're talking about imaginaries now and we haven't been talking about imaginaries in, in um say the past 50 years so much and this is because imaginaries to really understand them um and the difference that they have between like mere cultural narratives or ideologies is because they're especially relevant when we're talking, um, when humanity or our civilization is making a very big leap, a very big transition, then that transition isn't really happening just at the level of culture or ideologies, and I'm gonna get more into detail um, later, but it's a leap that's happening um, in imaginaries. And for you to really understand this, I'm gonna walk you through how imaginaries uh, were born and how the, the imaginaries evolved with us. So little imaginary session. This will be relevant for the workshop too. Imaginary is one on one. So how did imag how did imaginaries were born? Well, so here um, you can see uh, where these hunter gatherer societies um, enjoying a nice bonding fire by the lake. And you know back in back in this time we're starting to collaborate with each other. We're starting to create um, you know this this language and we're starting to create culture and we need this. Um, social glue that keeps us together and that it provides a framework in which we in which it makes it easier to collaborate with um, with each other and that social glue at the beginning before even before culture is the fact that we're all directly related um, either by blood so we're all kin or related by sharing food and resources in in the close tribe or also related to the fact that we were all dependent on the same environment to live. So we had this like natural connection to the natural world. And that was the glue um, that, that kept us working. And so the thing is that both, both kinship and the natural environment, they are, they're real things. Like they're not imaginary. Like if you're my, if you're my son or my daughter, that's a very real connection. I'm just not making up. Um, and that, or if we're like sharing food together, that's a very real connection that we have. And same with the environment, like the trees, the river that we took the fish in and the water in, like those were all um, real material stuff. But what we did is that we elevated this concept and we created an imaginary dimension on top of them. So that's the imaginary. It's like, that's how like the simulation starts. <laughs> we create the concept of the tribe, like this um, cohesion that we have. Um, like collective coherence. And then we have the spirit. The spirit is like this, like call it like the spirit. That's that's my naming. We call it like the flow of life, um, the chi. Mm, that's the, the belief that everything was kind of the same. And that's our how our like first beliefs in animism started. So there's like this, yeah, like natural, um, Flow of life is like natural energy that is like manifested through everything, and then we're all like part of it. Um, but yeah, so that's like how the first um, imaginaries were born. 
But what happened later is that with the rise of agricultural city states, we, first of all, we become much more people. So we are less in touch. Um, like it, the concept of a tribe that we're all like de- related or like sharing food with each other, like that's not uh, true anymore. Um, we go by, we, we surpass this uh, 150 Dunbar number. And we also lose, we're right now in, in, in agriculture city states, what we're doing is like mostly cultivating grains. And that's a classic uh, Harari, how the grains actually dominated us. But what that did is that this greatly diminished the connection that we had to our natural environment. And so these made um, our first stories to like start breaking. So what did we need in order to continue collaborating? Then we needed to create um, different stories. And so what we did is that from the tribe, we created the concept of the king and we were all part of the king's uh, kingdom. Um, actually, there's this, there's this like metaphor that, but actually was taken quite literally that everything is, um, it's part of, of the same kingdom. We're all like the body of the king. So the king has, like the king is just the environment, but we're all like part of the same thing. And everyone, no matter if you're like a priest, a peasant or a princess, like we're all exactly in the place that we need to be in the great, um, in the great order of life that's called the great chain of being. Um, and that's what created a lot of, of cohesion. There was no so much intention that we needed to progress or, or that you need to change your role because that was the role that was meant for you. And everyone fit perfectly in this divine order of the universe. And so that was king and the kingdom that like kept us together. But then from the spirit, we like, we capitalized, we personified um, the spirit into like capital G um, gods that now they ruled every part of our life. They ruled every part of our existence. Okay, now fast forward quite some years, many things happen between. Um, but when do we have again a very big transition of imaginary? Well, that's um, during the Enlightenment, the 18th century Enlightenment. Uh, we discover science, scientific method, rationality, and the stories of gods and kings, they just you know don't cut it anymore. Um, and what do we do in order to keep collaborating with each other? Well, we create new ideas, we create new stories. So instead of the king that rules everything according to divine um, guidance, now we have nation states that are ruled not by kings, but every man is its its own king now, and it's the self governing of the people. We all like govern each other in our own sovereignty, and then from the gods, like this ultimate authority that we want to explain everything that happens in society, we create the concept of the economy. And in the economy, everyone has its own right place too. We have our we derive our worth from our productivity and like how well we're like contributing to the economy and the nation. It's just a different a different story that we create in order to get um, this cohesion, get this cohesion working. A little clarification here: that doesn't mean that the concept of kings or gods is completely ruled out. As we well know, there's still kings even today, and there's many people still that believe in God. It's just that they stop being the main. Um, def- like the main definition, like the main cluster that we all group ourselves around in society. Okay, now the things about imaginaries that really, really like prevalent, like they inform and they impact every single aspect of our social existence, starting with our conception of the self. So um, how we think of ourselves and our place in the world is greatly defined by the imaginary that we inhibit. And so, as you know, before, in a modern, in a pre-modern social imaginary, mostly a good person was um, someone that was a good Christian that like knew their place in the great order of things, and they just did their role very well. Um, and now we change when we when we change to modernity. It's like, oh, now you have, now you have much more agency, and you can change things. And and the great the great qualities of someone is maybe how productive they are, how much they contribute to their nation, how much they contribute to the economy. Um, we change from like the most elite people being the noble born and being the priests uh, and the clergy to the most noble people being entrepreneurs or scientists. So that's uh, a meme that we're going to use later. It's essentially these um, capitalism versus um, what we have in uh, pre-modern social imaginary. And this is actually like 
quite relevant, for example, um, if we look like this under in quarantine that we were all so stressed, like this, you know, deep fear of not being productive is it is in the like a made up fear, especially by by our current modern imaginary. It affects a lot our conception of relationships, of, of what are good and fair relationships and how should be relating for each other, um, how should be relating with each other. For example, before we would have much more um our good relationships where the ones in which you know your role so maybe like your role in life is to be a father is to be a good wife is to be a peasant and and that's the thing like that's how you're made to be in the great order of things and that's your divine role and you just need to do that very well while when we transition to a pre-modern social imaginary roles uh change a lot and even they start getting a contractual undertone so good relationships are when we know each other's position um, and we know their goals and we help each other collaborate with these goals and we make contracts and agreements like for example the social contract and then we need to um, same like keep this contract with honor and responsibility uh, okay and also of course it affects a lot the the conceptions of the systems that we're ingrained in systems being natural systems or social systems and yeah a great example for this is yeah social contract versus the divine order of the cosmos. It's what provides um, directionality. Like, how do we take decisions? Should, you know, and who rules things? Is it just, you know, God's word? Or is it, do we have um, a meritocracy? Do we have a public sphere that we're um, all debating, you know, ideas and let the best ideas win? Um, so, yeah. So as we can see, the imaginaries are the collective unconscious. I say it's the... Um, what mediates our psyches, all of our psyches and our collective vision of society. And they are what provide, what create coherence, common coherence, directionality, like what should we be aiming for? And they are essentially what create our sense of normality. Normality, again, this is something that um, we talked about a lot this year, 2020, where normality is gone, where are we going back to normal? This is also very much related in the imaginary, as I'm gonna explain now. And this is also why, yeah, and this is also why they say a very common metaphor to refer to them is to say that imaginaries are like water for the fish. So it's something that is all around us, um, that we're like completely immersed in, but for most of us, they remain completely invisible. And, difference again with what i said like at the beginning how are they different from cultural ideology well they say that imaginaries are like the api of social life so they're essentially like the canvas where we construct all the other things um where we construct like all the other narratives or ideologies and this is very much um explicit when if you look at if you look at the ideologies that we created in the modern during the modern imaginary, so like capitalism, communism, socialism, or like fascism, they all directly refer either to the economy, like capitalism, communism, or socialism, like they're just different ideas on how should we organize the economy, or to fascism, like they refer directly to the nation state. And that's why, like when we're talking about um, culture change, you know, the next like the next ideologies is what we will have, like the ones that really make a leap of imaginary, they can't be constrained just with economy and nations, but we need to like really reinvent um, the whole thing, like think of, of better stories. So to sum it up, social imaginaries, they are the unconscious collective dimension that organizes our social life. And even though they are imaginary constructions, they are not actually real in the material sense, they are very deeply rooted in material reality. So as the world evolves, we evolve with it. Okay, now how is this relevant for today? Mm. In many ways, because like, you know the gist, this is like a tech conference. So technology is deeply changing our world, like deeply changing our material reality. Um, then we have globalization, same, it's, it's, really like blurring the boundaries of, of the nation state. This is a trend that has been happening for a longer period of time too. And then we have the paradox of capitalism. 
the fact that capitalism has been incredibly great in the sense of creating a world of vast material abundance, and it has greatly elevated our standards of living in many metrics. But at the same time, it's created, it's really depleting our natural world, um, created an epidemic of bullshit jobs and a deep sense of meaninglessness for a lot of people. Um, there's like deep, 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 deep social um, and economic inequality. I love that. So what we're seeing is that the main pillars that our imaginary is built on, nation states and the economy, are being, they're, they're bleaching, like they're, they're being deconstructed, they're being made less relevant, similar to what we had um, when gods and kings uh, were glitching, were, um, were being replaced with uh, no ideas. And same, same this goes um, with the fourth, like the different industrial revolutions that happened. And what does that make us? So that makes us um, narrative orphans in the sense that normality is gone. The collective coherence that we grouped ourselves under um, is breaking. And now we all look like Miman. So Miman, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is this character that comes uh, from the surreal memes um, type of memes that... I mean, I, I guess some of you might be familiar with it. And I think it really like represents very well that feeling of weirdness and that feeling of like, what the fuck is going on? Um, that is so prevalent in, in these past years. And especially today, especially in 2020. And what happens when, what happens when we're in this position where like the grand narratives have like all broken down? Well, so we have, we still need this social glue, we still need cohesion but it's hard to get that. So we have essentially the right that wants to go back to the previous narratives that we have. And that's why their right today is like appealing to, you know, make America great again, or like, you know, like a lot of like nationalism, because that's where we feel safe. Like that's a narrative that we're all familiar with, the nation state. Um, and that's why the left is essentially just eating itself. And like the great left's greatest plan is just to say no to what the right is doing but it doesn't really feel like they have a, a grand vision for what could come next, that it's mostly based in, in just saying no to, to the rise of the alt right. And so what that makes us is, um, our current society is like, we have the most advanced iPhone, like say the iPhone 2020, but we're still running on a very old software on essentially like 18th century software. That's even way more older than Snake, but that's the better analogy that I could come up with. Um, and as we all know, what happens when there's such a big difference between our software and our software and, and hardware? Well, that our, devi our devices start to glitch. So what we have today, what we've seen a lot this year is that our current social imaginary, all of our current narratives, they're glitching, they're breaking down. And to be honest, this is not a trend that has been unique of 2020, even though this year has been magnified. This is essentially like a lot of accumulation of changes that were happening during the years. It really, at least for me, started to break in 2016 um, with a sense of these like really like weird, this like descending to the weirdness that comes with like Harambe, like the meme of Harambe, the gorilla that was dead. Then it the major glitch was the election of Donald Trump that uh, put the whole world on, on hold. And it's before we had this like sense of normality, even though normality is always extremely constructed, but then it really starts to break um, recently, 2016. And that's the weird thing. We have a, a it opens up this, this like era where like things just like seem to like start getting very weird. The simulation starts glitching more and more. And However, what change? However, oops. However, what changed with this year? What changed with this year is that we have Corona, and Corona comes, and it really puts the whole world on hold. Um, what it made us is it really made us open the eyes. So, like before, we could still pretend that you know things were kind of like okay. We had this sense of things are weird, but most of us could still carry on with our normal lives and pretend that this was not happening. What has changed really in like 2020 
is that now we're just forced to drop the pretense to like just accept because it's like straight in straight up in your face that things are extremely weird and these things just keep getting weirder and weirder um but what did corona really change so you know we have been talking a lot about the future of work the future of education um, and now it's just real. Now we're all working from our homes and this students like students from, you know, their laptop with like digitalized content, the retail apocalypse that has been building up actually for quite a while. But now it's here essentially by law as all of our corner shops are closed and then we're all forced to buy on Amazon. Then the social inequality that same, we've been talking about it for a while. Now it's just plain sticking in the obvious as we, you know, divide our workers between essential workers and non-essential all the tech people being able to like get um, their money regardless, but um, you're working from home while so many of others are just, yeah, actually right there. <laughs> Massive surveillance, but now we're asking for it. Uh, having people um, asking the con um, the government to like trace all of, all of our contacts, the ascent uh, of China, the decline in the US, like is there any time that it's just more real how the US is um, really breaking down? Um, the demand for fossil fuels completely drops and the fragility of our supply chains uh, get completely exposed. So those, those, all of these are trends that they had been building up for a long time, but because we're so reluctant to change, um, we just, we're postponing, because I mean, change is really hard. So we were postponing them and then Corona really like forces us and it just blasts open the gates of the future in a way. And that's why the first days of the pandemic felt so weird because we were literally fish that had been taken out of the water. It's like fish in the void, in the narrative void. And now the big question is what is next? Because will all this weirdness um, change tomorrow at 12, you know, when we get finally to uh, 2021? Uh, will this, you know, will we like re restart? Uh, are we ever going back to normal? And the thing is that for me, normality, we might get some sense of routine and we might get some sense of that things are somewhat stable-ish, like we're getting it right now. I mean, after all, we're um, animals of habit, so we get used to whatever we have. But normality in the sense that, you know, we know where we're at and we have like a narrative that uh, can make sense of our life and our relationships and and a shared sense of directionality that we're all working, that we're all walking towards. Um, that's not going to happen um, anytime soon. That sense of like having a like new imaginary that we all share is going to take um, some more work and some more years and definitely a lot more uh, weird things happening and a lot more glitches happening. Mm, and that's why we say welcome to the Perma Weird. Welcome to the Perma Weird world. Um, this is actually a concept uh, by Venkatesh Rao. I highly encourage um, all of us, who are in all of you who are interested in in these con in this weirdening and breaking down of imaginaries, to check out his work. And yeah, now we're gonna go to a workshop where we're gonna try to, instead of getting stuck in the perma weird, imagine how it would be to be another human in in twenty seventy. So imagine how does it feel to live in a solar punk imaginary. So thank you very much for being here. It was lovely. And yeah.